reminds me back, you know, before we had smartphones, you'd see these advertisements on TV at like 12 o'clock at night, and it'd be like for this, uh, I was telling you about it before, these hand scanners, you have this video, and you'd pretend to, to scan your hand, and you could see an x-ray image of your hand, and, and you'd, you know, SMS, like, scan your hand to 1-3 scanner, mm. and then it cost like $2 or whatever it is. And then, you know, for the next six months, you'd get a $5 charge to your credit card. And so there's huge legislation behind it. But it's like, you know, you've got this total application, this 99 cent application. You know, how, how are you going to market that? Um, and, uh, you know, because you, you can't pay for that on PPC. In fact, there's some apps, you just, people will not type this stuff into Google. You know, so how do you, how do you market that kind of thing? Um, you know, so having a viral component behind that is, is just critical where people are sharing it if you can get picked up by PR because that's an extremely low price point. You know, as your price point gets higher, you can afford to have salespeople put on staff that can spend personal time one-on-one -on -one with someone. That's the ultimate level of sales. That's a 99 cent app. <laughs> yeah, you can't. You just can't. You know, your labor cost is just way too high. The profitability for each sale is just so low. Um, so when something's that low, you really need to have just mass spectrum advertising that's an extremely low price point uh, for your media purchasing. Um, so, you know, your strategy really alters depending on your um, uh, average transaction value, ATV. So if you've got a high ATV, average transaction value, say $50,000, $100,000, you can afford to put sales staff to back you can up. put some investment yeah. into that. Absolutely, because you don't need to, you need to close one sale. You've paid for one, one salesperson's salary for the entire year. Um, or at least half of it. You know, when you're dealing with something that's um, maybe $30 per month, you need to have mass spectrum advertising. Um, so, it really, ATV is going to depend, sorry, determine a lot about your marketing and sales strategy. Um, so, mm. the good news is, uh, I think I think the stat is 67% of apps now are discovered socially. Uh, so that used, used to be a lot less than that, um, and people would search the App Store a lot more to find applications, but now we're seeing more and more, and I, honestly I would say over the next few years that that will probably go to 90-95% um, of apps being discovered socially, you know, in terms of word of mouth. So again, I think it goes back to value in creating an incredible product, whether it's, you know, Angry Birds, or whether it's, you know, a, a really amazing accounting tool, you know, whatever it is. Um, if you create that value, then, you know, people sort of rave about it and you get that word of mouth response, so. Yeah, determines a lot. Um, okay, I've got one last question then. Yeah, uh, can I use offline advertising for an online app? Yeah, I brought this up because uh, I saw, uh, I was at Melbourne University, I saw someone spray canned, they had like a stencil, and they spray canned this thing called Nightlight from Admiral logo in their application. I looked it up on my phone. It wasn't on Android, so it's only on an iPhone, so I'm like, oh this is this is great. But you know, I mean that's that's guerrilla marketing. They've actually walked around with a spray can spray. And now these guys were funded by the government, I think. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, a lot of people think, well it's an online product, we need to sell it um, through online media. But you know, some some stuff is just exceptionally like I still use direct mail. I think it's great. You know, there's some stuff you can do with direct mail you just can't do with mm. with PPC. It gives you access to people you can't reach. Um, a lot can of stuff is not so. Sorry? sorry? Can you give us an example of direct mail working? Yeah, yeah. Well, for instance, targeting C-level executives uh, within a particular vertical uh, is a great way to do it. Um, for branding, it's it's really useful because these people just leave their direct mail on the table. You know, it's it just sits there for weeks and weeks. You know, so. But in terms of tracking uh, analytics, it falls behind massively. Um, in comparison to, to digital. So um, branding is just another thing that just demolishes online. Uh, I mean, you can obviously do your, your branding based um, GDN advertising, Google Display Network. Um, but you know, if you really want to blanket an area or, or a geography, you know, using banners and posters is just a really very, very powerful um, branding thing to do that you, just, you can't get the same economies of scale from online uh, without paying a huge amount of of money for it so there's this stuff that you can do with offline media that you just can't do um, with online so um, but yeah I just thought that was a really interesting one because people think they're limited to, to online and I think that you know there's a lot of you can still do a lot of analytic stuff which is you know what we're talking pearls pearls is another really good example tracking offline um, direct mail is, is something that's really interesting that you can do you send out a hundred mail pieces right and yet they've all got unique URLs. It might be, I don't know, 
the site's um, appster, appster.com slash uh, John Smith, and you can actually track who's ac accessing your mail and, and then build a responsive list based on who's opened your mail and gone to the website. Mm -hmm. So you can still get analytics from direct mail. A lot of people, yeah, sort of don't even realize that there's a lot of stuff that's really interesting you can do. With so would you say that's more of a, just a different form of online advertising? Or? Sorry? The, would you say that's just more of a, a different form of online advertising? Like oh, using uh, something like Pearl's personalized URL. It's sort of integrating the two. So you've got, uh, you know, you're using some old school advertising, advertising, maybe doing direct mail campaigns, but then using a Pearl. So they would visit a website and then you'd integrate that with uh, online analytics. Okay. Does that make sense? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting because if you send out those 100 mail pieces, or let's say it's 100,000, and you're getting a response rate, you know, it's direct mail is very low. It's maybe. I mean, there's companies that survive on about one eighth of percent, and they're still profitable. Um, and if you can actually track that and see what eighth of a percent of that hundred thousand um, campaign you know, target list is, you can then really laser target your cold calling to that list. So you know that's all direct mail offline stuff that you can get really actionable analytics around. Um, but yeah, I just thought you know the Melbourne University example where people are spray canning stuff. Uh, very much guerrilla marketing was just so interesting because that was mobile phone application that was like, I'm looking at it on the ground in front of me. It's just really, uh, really interesting. Um, Any questions? Yeah. Any questions? Absolutely. Curious. Um, obviously, <coughs> we're at a point in the market where there are clearly some um, do's and don'ts around marketing, particularly with apps and, and new, and new um, products like that. But have you encountered anything where you thought the marketing strategy should work for this app that you've done for client and it hasn't? And conversely, things which you thought just wouldn't work but have surprised you? Yeah, um, we we don't actually consult. I mean, we it's not like we consult. I mean, we'll direct, but we don't manage the marketing strategy. Uh, mainly because it's not within our core competency and we focus on what's in our core competency. Um, but yeah, I mean, there have been times where I've, I've definitely been surprised by someone's, um, you know, the way that someone's gone about it. Um, we have a client that has like, I don't know, like 200,000 likes on Facebook now. And, you know, sometimes you look at Facebook and think, oh, you know, they're just going to put together some crappy little page and maybe get 600 likes. But this sort of thing, like, you know, in terms of, uh, again, going back to content marketing um, and the educational stuff that they were doing, just it added a lot of value. So people, this thing just took off like wildfire and now, you know, they've got like 200,000 subscribers over these six different segments uh, of certain customers and that's worked really well for them. Um, does, it, does it always work well? Probably not, but again, I, like I said before, like you really have to go back to what your objectives are. And, you know, who, who, who's the audience that you're trying to target? Where are they speaking? Where are they hanging out? And then sort of like focus on that. Mm. Yeah, there's, um, just to add to that, there's uh, one, I mean, you can get really clever with marketing um, and the way that you're doing lead generation and building your own lists and um, I work a bit uh, with the Salvation Army um, and I met this one guy, his name's Fernando from Sao Paulo in Brazil and he runs, uh, he helps people stay in Australia and they have to buy courses like student courses and his business is entirely like an agency that sells courses to individuals um, that are from, you know, from Brazil, from Sao Paulo or from Brasilia or from Natal and uh, that's the only way they can stay up here so they end up buying these these uh, student courses, never going to the courses, and just, just so they can stay in Australia because they can't get a working holiday visa. It's this really, really fascinating market. But what this guy actually does, he runs um, Brazilian parties for international students. And when people walk in the door, he asks a couple of questions. This is really, really interesting. He asks, what's your name? Uh, where are you from? And when does your visa expire? <laughs> and he's got this database, and so timing is everything. Like he'll he'll go through that list, and when that four weeks out, he'll call these people up and say, "Do you want to stay in Australia?" They'll say, "Yes." They'll say, "Well, we got the course for you," <laughs> and he'll close them like that because he's got the data there. Now, there's there's no way you can get that kind of information. The guy runs a nightclub. He's selling student <laughs> courses, like, and he, he, he runs a nightclub and makes money, but it's not there to do that. It's there to build a list of Brazilian students living or Colombian South American students that, that aren't eligible for a working holiday visa because only um, Argentina is, um, I think. 
yeah, it's Argentina or Chile, one of the, one of the two. Um, Europe, you can get a working holiday visa for two years in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, but this guy just wants access to, you know, what's these people's email address? What's their phone number? What's their name? And when they, when it, you know, when's their visa running out? And he just calls them up and he closes them like that. The guy's grown uh, just rapidly in six months, hugely. So there's people doing really clever stuff like that that is taking you know, really traditional business models and applying extremely clever marketing to it and, and just making a lot of money. Um, so I think it's just a, need more examples like that. Like that's, if you can pair up a great application with, with a great marketing strategy, you're just gonna, just in terms of your revenue, you're just gonna grow it rapidly. Um, but I think that's pretty much all we got today. Well, you've had a question? Yeah, just one more The whole conversation is focused a lot on B2C marketing. How much does all of this philosophy change when it comes to B2B marketing? Uh, mass marketing, uh, analytics fall through, stenciling your name yeah, on the ground, yeah. everything. Uh, how do you address that? Good, really good question. Um, like I said before, even uh, with, with content marketing, I wasn't even necessarily saying that that was just for consumers. Um, and I've done research on this myself just because I'm already really interested in, in you know, selling to B2B as well. Um, and and uh, some of the research I did and some things that I looked at was that especially with high level execs, they actually, they actually spend more time researching on the internet than consumers do, than normal consumers do. So content, content marketing and, and you know, putting together inbound strategy, you know, your blogs and, and white papers and resources and all those sorts of things, really building that credibility is still really, really super relevant to more high level execs or CIOs, CTOs, you know, whoever else. Um, so yeah, I think, I think the, the core principles of, of what we've been going through here, whether it's, whether it's uh, you know, creating a world-class product, focusing on how you can really deliver incredible value so that people rave about your product as well, um, creating amazing educational content so that people can learn from you and you really establish yourself as a thought leader. You know, all these things, I think, regardless of whether you're B2C or B2B, uh, you know, the, the principles are the same. That's, yeah, that's my opinion. <laughs> Yeah, I think with um, B2B as well, like you're dealing typically in an environment where the ATV, your average transaction value is higher, you'll find there's, there's a much more of a focus towards one-on-one um, -on -one conversations with sales people and less of a focus on marketing and lead generation. Um, particularly if you look at something like UC Unified Communications, your handsets, uh, in big, big enterprises, you're dealing a minimum of 300,000. ERP is another really good example of a high price point item that you just never see any marketing behind because everything's tendered out and the salespeople just always focus on the tenders. Um, there's just never any marketing. Uh, the only time they use marketing is for perception management, uh, which is we want to look like a big company, like we can throw our weight into it, which is both to look like we've got the labor resources, but also uh, the other big thing for B2B is if you're doing a $300,000 contract and you screw it up, your SLA, goes badly, particularly in the medical arena, they want to they want to feel comfortable that they can suit you and <laughs> you know and actually get money from you. So if you're one of these small operators and you can just close your shop like that and they can't because uh, effectively when something goes wrong it just becomes they're trying to minimize their costs. Uh, so if you can just fold your, your cards like that, then they don't want to do business with you simply because they know that if anything goes wrong they're they're up shit creek. So it's um, a lot of things change, so there's, there's, there's less of a focus on marketing and it's more face-to-face -face conversations with BDMs. Um, I mean, you've got B2B that is low ATV, um, and that's you know when people are selling lampshades to restaurants and that kind of thing. That is B2B. Um, but B2B is, yes, the focus is much more on sales. It's much more on building an ambassador, as, as we talk about, like you know, building an ambassador within an organization and empowering that person with um, sales and marketing collateral. Um, there's also, to my, this is a bit of a generalization, but there's, there's a huge focus towards education. A lot of the products that are being sold in B2B, like your ERP systems, UC, RCMT, mm -hmm. uh, software products, um, it is a huge learning curve. Um, so there's a lot of focus around white papers, um, less on flashy graphics. Uh, so education is a really big thing, which is where content strategy comes in as well. You know, so it's B2B does exceptionally well on content strategy. Appster does exceptionally well on content strategy. Uh, does that sort of no. answer your question? Cool. Okay. Hopefully next time we'll have a